this will probably not shed any light at all on, uh, on art or theory or the new aesthetic because I'm an end user. And, uh, and this is kind of, well, this is, this is sort of the thing that happens to me. Oh, I'm also a science fiction writer. And, um, and we've already dealt with the ethical machines. You know, Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics. We did that like 70 years ago. And so when I see, you know, things like that, all I can think is, oh, bitch, please. Anyway, I was at the very beginning of my career, and, uh, um, well, actually, it was before I was at the very beginning of my career, when I was at the very beginning of my life, almost. Uh, I was five years into it, and I died. And uh, I was having heart surgery, and I died, and they brought me back. So, um, so I went on, and this is, uh, this is a story about life and death. And first, we're going to have the death part. And this is going to be the second time I died. And uh, I, I had, after I had the heart operation, I was told that if I had any, even just got my teeth cleaned, I would have to take antibiotics because then I could, I, if I didn't, I could get myocarditis, which is an infection in the lining of your heart. So, um, so I, I was used to this routine where I'd take antibiotics for a week, go to the dentist, and then take antibiotics for the next week. And, uh, and I may be the reason why there's, you know, resistant, antibiotic-resistant organisms, but I just did what they told me. I'm an end user. So um, then this time when I went to the dentist, I was going after I'd had, uh, I'd had an infection and I'd been treated with penicillin. And six weeks later, I had to go to the dentist. And, uh, and they said, oh, we've changed the, the, you know, the procedure with the antibiotics. You take a whole bunch just before your appointment, and then you take the rest of it for like two days afterwards or something. I said, wow, that's different. So I looked at the dosage, and they were going to give me a gram of penicillin. And I thought, wow, that's a lot of penicillin all at once. I'd better watch for a rash. And 20 minutes after I took the pills, I went right past the rash stage into anaphylactic shock. And I was home alone. And I knew that the problem with anaphylactic shock is you start swelling up, and your throat swells closed, and you suffocate. But I was going too fast to, to swell up that much. And when your blood pressure is dropping that quickly, you become very calm because you're too stupid to be scared. And so I was very calm, and, except that I was itchy because I, I did have finally the rash stage uh, in the middle of swelling up and then swelling down again. And so I, uh, I called the dentist and I must have sounded very coherent because he said, oh, well, you just get in the car, and you come down here, and I'll give you a shot of, you know, whatever antihistamine it was. So I said, oh, okay. While I'd been talking to him, I'd been stripping my clothes off because I was itchy, and I had to scratch everywhere. So by the time I got talking with him, I, 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 was, I was buck naked. And I thought, oh, I can't put these clothes on again because I was itchy. So I started to walk to the laundry basket, and every time I started to walk, I started to pass out. So I had to crawl on my hands and knees, and I just pulled stuff out of the laundry basket and, and, and put on whatever I could. And then I crawled back down, and I got my purse and my, my keys, and I thought, you know, if I can't walk without passing out, I probably shouldn't drive. So now this is Overland Park, Kansas, and you can't just walk outside and hail a cab. And you actually can't even just call a cab. So I, but I found a cab company, I called them, and, uh, and they said, we can have someone there in an hour. And I said, and they said, is that okay? I said, no, I won't be here in an hour. So I hung up, and I finally, I called the, the emergency number. Nine, in, in America, it's 911. So I, I had a moment of pause where I was going to dial 9, and I couldn't find the 11 key. But then it passed, and I just pressed one twice, and it worked. So uh, I told them what my problem was, and they said they'd be right there. And I knew they would because they were maybe three, four blocks away. So I thought, OK, now what do I have to do? And I kind of flashed back in my mind uh, all the other times that I'd been in an emergency room. I was living in a big city, and I thought, you know, it could be crowded. I'd better find a book to read. So I found a book to read. I thought, what else? My mother had always told me that 
if you take something and it seems like you're going to pass out and maybe die, you should hold the empty bottle in your hand so that the ambulance people know what you've taken. I thought, okay, I've got that. What else should I do? I thought, I'm going to go out and sit in the front step because I bet they're going to pull up in front of the wrong house. So I sat on the front step, and they pulled up in front of the wrong house. And then they backed up, and, they, and, and five of them came up the, the, uh, the walk towards me. And this was where things really started to get wavy because um, I was sure that I was sitting up. But when they picked me up to take me inside, they picked me up from a lying down position. So, and they, they took me in the kitchen and they put the most comfortable pillow in the world under my head. And they put in the, you know, the saline drip and they started, you know, all the, the stuff and they, you know, they undressed me and they saw the heart surgery scar. And I said, oh, don't worry about that. That's, you know, that's old. And, uh, and at that point, I started to get nervous. That was the one time that I got nervous because I thought we should be going to the hospital, but we just stayed in my kitchen for a really long time. And they called my, the, the man I was married to at the time, they called him at work and told him, you know, and about it. And, and I said, uh, is there some problem? And they said, well, we're having a little trouble getting your, your blood pressure up. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm famous for my low blood pressure. What is it? And they said, it's 50 over zero. And I said, oh, that's low even for me. So they, um, so, but finally we, we got to the hospital and, and then everyone I ever met in my life came to see me uh, as I was lying there for, I don't know, I don't know how long. And, and I was still, my face was still a little swollen and my, my then husband came in and, uh, and looked at me, and I had looked at myself in the mirror just after I'd called the, the ambulance, and, and I thought, God, I hope I don't have to stay like this, you know? And, uh, and, and I said to him, how do I look? And he said, pretty bad. So, um, so a little while later, I, I began to kind of get more alert, and one of the paramedics came back, and, uh, and he said, how you doing? And I said, good, you? And, uh, and he said, I just wanted to, to see how you were because uh, we don't know how you did it, lady, because you were dead when we got there. And it still didn't penetrate. And finally, this, this very fatherly doctor came and uh, he gave me a shot of, of something and he gave me a prescription for something else and sent me home. And the whole time that I was home, I just couldn't stay awake. I just couldn't stay awake at all. I just slept the day away. And at one point I woke up in sort of early evening and I said to my, to my husband, I'm sorry, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just can't stay awake. And he said, when you almost die, it takes a lot out of you. And then it began to kind of penetrate. So, nine days later, we had our sixth wedding anniversary. And uh, we went out, we had a great time. We had a lot of fun. And then we came home, and we had even more fun. Now, I was, let's see, 31 at the time. And, uh, and I was, uh, I was, uh, oh, I should have warned the men in the audience that there will be now be a discussion of lady parts in a way that often makes men scream like girls and run away. But, sorry. I was using um, a contraceptive called the Today Vaginal Sponge. And it was a big improvement over the diaphragm. Because I remember my encounter with the diaphragm. The last time I handled the diaphragm, it sprang out of my hands and stuck to the bathroom ceiling. And I came out, you know, and I said, well, I said, I'm out of the mood. So the Today Vaginal Sponge was a big improvement. It just was soft and, you know, it had lots of spermicide. It just, you know. And so we proceeded to have a wonderful night. And then the next morning, I couldn't get the bitch out. Not my husband, the sponge. <laughs> and uh, I tried. No. He tried. 
And then he came in from the kitchen with salad tongs. And I said, get away from me. So I looked at the box, you know, it's like problems. What to do if you cannot get the Today Vaginal Sponge out? If you cannot get the Today Vaginal Sponge out, if you, no, if you cannot remove the Today Vaginal Sponge, please go immediately to your nearest emergency room as you are in danger of anaphylactic shock. I thought, I can't win. So I said to my husband, take me to the emergency room. And he said, no, I'm going to mow the lawn. You go. It's your problem. This contributed to the divorce, I'm sure. But, and I was mad. Boy, I slammed out of the house, and I got in my little car, and I drove to the emergency room. And it was a Sunday morning, so, you know, it was like, I was the only one there. People behind the desk were, you know, they were, they were you know, doing crosswords, and they were filing their nails, and I came up, and I, I walked up, and the woman behind the, the, the desk said, can I help you? And I just burst out laughing. And I told her what my problem was, and she said, you know, just go right back. So I was sitting, waiting for the nurse to come, and finally the nurse came, and she was having a lot of trouble keeping a straight face. And I, I looked up at her, and she said my name, and I said, yes, that's me. She said, and <clears throat> where is your foreign body lodged? And I thought, oh, yeah, all the guys that they've seen come in, I backed into a doorknob, you know. I fell on a plunger. And I said, it's a contraceptive sponge. So we had a good laugh, and she took me and put me in the, you know, in the, in the stirrups, and I'm waiting for the doctor, and the doctor comes in, and it's the same doctor. And he did a double take, and I did a double take, and then I, I went. So um, the Today Vaginal Sponge was removed without a second occurrence of anaphylactic shock. But the nurse took me aside just before I left, and she said, you should know that it was out of position and it might not have been effective. Now, my son is 27. <laughs> and um, we, hadn't, we hadn't planned for, him, for, for anything that soon, but, uh, but I, I'm a big believer in serendipity. Serendipity is chance favors the prepared mind. And, uh, and I had decided after I had, you know, come back from, from the dead that what I was going to do with the rest of my life was be alive. And you can't get much more alive than incubating another human being. And, uh, and so, of course, uh, uh, I'll just skip over the birth. It was, it was, you know, uneventful, except that it was exactly... He arrived exactly on his due date. There, there will be no description of, of labor here, so, you know, don't panic. And uh, it's the only time I think I've been on time for anything in the last 30 years. People would say to me, when is he due? And I'd say, well, what time is it now? So, uh, so he arrived, and, and he's a wonderful, magical human being. And, uh, and, you know, it's like children always are. Children are always wonderful and magical, and they're, they're, and where do all the mediocre adults come from? But, so I thought, you know, it's like, he's, he's so, he's so special in this way that, that I'm going to, I'm going to really try my damnedest not to screw him up too much. And, uh, and I didn't screw him up too much. He, he lives with us now. Well, he doesn't live with us. He, he has his own place. But when I moved to, to Britain to, to be with my husband, we, I, brought, I brought my whole family, which consists of my son and my mother, old, unkillable. She's 92. And uh, uh, so I brought my son. And, um, and he was one of those, one of those kids who, who kind of falls between the stools at school. Teachers give up on him. And, uh, and teachers gave up on him. He went back to live in, with his dad in America for a while, and teachers gave up on him faster there. And now he's getting his master's degree in Japanese studies. 
and uh, and he does he does experimental avant-garde music. He's a composer and performer, but for a day job, he works for this company that contracts with the local council in London to make repairs on the homes of the elderly and the handicapped. And what what he does is the elderly and the handicapped call in and they say my refrigerator broke, and they get my son. My son talks them down from whatever ledge they're on, because if they're old, they're probably on a ledge. And then he assigns a, you know, someone to go out and fix it. And, um, and I can't think of anything that makes me happier than knowing that my son talks to people who are elderly and handicapped and, and, and makes their lives just a little bit better. And I am prouder of him than I, than I would be if he were a, a, a lawyer. Well, certainly a lawyer. But um, anyway, that's, that's my story. And uh, it, it, will, it gives you nothing of the new aesthetic. It doesn't, uh, doesn't really illuminate anything. And basically, it's me just telling you about how heaven doesn't want me and hell's afraid I'll take over. But, uh, but I, I am a science fiction writer, I'm a storyteller, and that's the story I've told you tonight. <laughs>